Arrival in White River on a September afternoon. The Bud Car train arrives in White River late in the afternoon. On this September afternoon, the parking lot of the station is filled with cars and trucks meeting people from the region and traveling farther west. Getting ready for departure from White River on a September morning. The train departs for Sudbury early in the morning after its arrival. The yellow footstool serves as a beacon of welcome for arriving passengers. Getting ready for departure on a February morning. On this February morning, with the temperature at minus 24 degrees Celsius, the train awaits its passengers. The lake beside the highway at White River. The motels in White River are on the Trans-Canada Highway across town from the railway station. Across from the gas station on the highway is a lot with a number of transport trucks, some with trailers and some without. Behind the trucks, a little lake becomes visible in the fall evening light. Morning mist on the river by the tracks, White River. The sun is still rising after departure and mist remains on the river by the tracks. Decoupling for repairs, White River. Bud car trains are made up of one or more self-propelled diesel coaches. One of the three coaches on our train suffered a transmission problem and was decoupled and towed to the shop in White River by the front coach, which then returned to join the second car and proceed on its way. Dawn. In winter, sunrise comes farther down the track than in the summer and fall. On this lake, it turns the frozen surface a blue color. A new passenger boards at the Froons Junction. Froons Junction is the place where the CPR track and the railway from Sault Ste. Marie on its way to Hearst meet and cross. The north-south line is just visible in front of the train, illuminated by the rising sun. A sun, partially seen on the right, is delivering his mother to the train for the trip east to Sudbury. The Froons Junction. The station building at Froons and the train serve as a foreground for the sunlit woods to the west. La Calche Crossing. Another passenger boarded at La Calche, a former mining town where a couple of original houses still remain. Birch Woods. This photograph of birches was taken through the window somewhere between Mill 88 and White River. Cedar Strip Fishing Boats in the Luggage Compartment. At the last moment before the train was to leave White River, a truck appeared with two cedar strip wooden fishing boats, which were loaded into the baggage car. Unloading fishing boats for a lodge at mile 88 from White River. At mile 88 below White River, the fishing boats were unloaded for one of the fishing lodges on the lake. House by the Tracks, Missinabi. Missinabi on Dog Lake is a community with a long history of fur trading. It is located on the Mishapacotton Missinabi North South River and Lake Route to James Bay, a fur trading route traditionally used by Indigenous peoples of the area as well as the Hudson's Bay Company. This canoe path crosses the 19th century colonial railway at right angles at the town of Missinabi, thus creating a junction of two different commercial networks. This is an inhabited house by the tracks, but there are also uninhabited ones, including the old HBC store. The Service Manager in Action The Bud Car Train is a social institution and a community in itself. The train connects small remote communities with few or no roads to the outside world. This amelioration of isolation is facilitated by the staff of the train, both engineers and the service manager particularly the latter. The service manager knows many of the passengers from past trips, and I am grateful to the service managers I met on my trips, including Lee's, shown here in action. TJ, an engineer on the train. Because the Bud Car train is made up of self-propelled cars with no isolated locomotive, the engineers come into contact with passengers as they pass through the train and the baggage cars. TJ is one of the engineers I met on my February 2020 trip. Campers disembarking en route. Campers from a boys' canoe tripping camp disembark at their camp's northern headquarters at an old fishing camp overseen by the service manager Lees. Chaplow Platform. 
The town of Chapleau is roughly at the midpoint of the rail corridor between Sudbury and White River. Originating as a railway construction town in the 19th century, it became the biggest community on the route as a railway and fur trading center as well as a lumbering town. Old Houses in Chapleau Old houses in the town of Chapleau catch the photographer's eye. Fishing boats for rent in Chapleau An important part of Chapleau's economy is summer tourism, including fishing. Fishing boats are for rent at this marina. The lumber mill at Chapleau from the train. The lumber mill outside town as seen from the train. The buildings can be seen on the left of the photograph. Boarding a freight engine in the Chapleau rail yard. Chapleau continues as a Canadian Pacific railway center, although a declining one. In this photograph, the Chapleau station master climbs aboard a freight engine. Red Chapleau Boathouse. I must admit a fondness for old boathouses. This one is found on the Kebasquashing River in Chapleau. Waiting for the Bud Car Train in Chapleau. Passengers wait for the Bud Car Train in the background. Also to be seen is the footbridge over the tracks to downtown Chapleau and a Toronto bound streetcar on a flat car manufactured in Thunder Bay. Morning Mist, a misty river somewhere east of Chapleau. Summer Wetland. Wetlands are important to the ecosystem of the Canadian Shield, including as habitat for beaver. I spotted numerous beaver dams, but was almost always unsuccessful snapping them in time. Clear cutting along the tracks. Lumbering along the railway line has been a key part of the economy of communities along it and is the reason for the existence of many, as well as the disappearance of some once the mills move on. Lake View. A lake through the window of the train showing wetlands as well. The Biscuitacing General Store in February. Biscuitacing was born as a lively railway construction town in the 1880s before the main CP center moved to Chapleau. After its resultant decline, it was revived as a lumber town until the 1920s when it declined once again. Currently, it has about 30 winter residents with an expanding population in the summer. Biscuitacing Pine Walking through Biscuitacing, I was struck by this white pine tree. It was notable because there are not many pines to be seen. I attribute this to lumbering and the millions of board feet of white and red pine removed from the area. The Old Catholic Church in Biscuitacing There were two churches in Biscuitacing during its more prosperous days, an Anglican church and this Roman Catholic one, presently derelict. Island on a snowy ground During a snowstorm east of Biscuitacing, this little island called out to be photographed from the train. This is a color photograph turned black and white by the snow. Snow blown by the train. Snow is blown by the train as it traveled down the track. Lake Islands in a Snowstorm 1. I found these islands in the far distance of a snowy lake very attractive. Lake Islands in a Snowstorm 2. Another color photograph of islands in the distance through the snowfall. Snowy River. If not a snowy lake beside the track, then a snowy river. Waiting on the siding in the rain for the freight to go by. The Bud Car train usually has to wait for freight trains rather than the other way around. Here, it waits on a siding in the summer rain. Unloading in Sudbury. Arrival in Sudbury reflects the similar scene of the arrival in White River. Trucks and cars wait in the parking lot for passengers and their luggage, some arrivals carrying containers of fish taken from northern lakes. The engineers stand watching in the open door of the baggage car.